don't know about you, but I was just singing that song, Amazing Grace, and just my heart was burning inside me with those words. I don't know about you, but something of those words still carry so much power, don't they? Am I, am I the only one, or am I getting an amen? Yeah, like <laughs> John Newton, this man... <clears throat> who wrote those words, amazing grace who saved a wretch like me. Even as I'm sharing it, I'm just feeling the power of the Holy Spirit because this man was a wretch. He had everything that the world could offer him at the time. He exploited human beings for his own gain. He shipped them from one side of the world to the other. He was right in the middle of all of it. And in a moment where he encountered the person of Jesus, he realised that all that the world had to offer was nothing, nothing and meaningless and wretched. Because he realised in those moments that there was an eternity. There was something more. And he was in a time with his forebears, William Wilberforce was around at the same time, a man that we celebrate and a film that you've possibly seen um, of his life, a man who worked his entire life to abolish that which John Newton at one point was right in the middle of. And Wesley was around at the time as well, completely transforming and changing the world as he knew it travelling from one city and town to another, preaching good news and often having stuff thrown at him, often being reviled. But we have not seen another time like that in British history. He literally, with himself and his preachers, of which we are now a part as a free Methodist family, he completely transformed society as we know it through the power of God at work in him. Does your heart not burn for that again and long for that, a move of God like that? Okay, there's two of us. (laughs) Friends, I long for this and my heart was burning inside me and I felt like God say, you need to pay attention to this sermon series. These are the keys right here, that I'm giving you one key one that I'm preaching on this morning, humility. Power in the kingdom of God is released through humility. This is one of the keys to the kingdom of God and to the awakening of ourselves to who he really is, to his power at work in us. Do you want to see Blackpool and the surrounding areas changed? Yeah. Isn't the world upside down right now? I want to see it the right way up. I want to see lives being transformed. I want to see the power of God working in and through the people of God to bring his kingdom here on earth. And humility is a key. And I want to look this morning at Daniel chapter 4 and 5. And we've been journeying through the book of Daniel together. And please, if you haven't seen those podcasts, seen the um, YouTube clips or the podcasts yet, you've not listened, please listen in. I think they're massively important. But I'm going to be looking at humility this morning in Daniel chapter 5 and 6. And just to give it a bit of context, and I want to give the, there's a lot to cover. So I'm just going to do chapters 4 and 5 in a quick pricey. Essentially, Nebuchadnezzar has a vision um, and in this vision he sees this resplendent tree with beautiful green leaves and fruit all over it and all the animals of the field underneath this tree and eating and this tree was so, so tall it reached to the heavens, it says in the scripture. And then he saw in this vision something that petrified him. It scared him. And and essentially down from heaven came a messenger of God and chopped down the tree. And um, years went by. 
where this, this tree was essentially just, it was just on the floor. <laughs> and then it was restored. And essentially in this vision, Nebuchadnezzar gets all of his magicians and all of his conjurers and all of the people that he could get hold of to try to give him wisdom on what this, this meant and they couldn't answer him. They could not give an answer. Just as a side point, don't we do that quite a lot? <laughs> not with conjurers or magicians, but don't we look to lots and lots of other things to try to get answers to the questions that we're wrestling with? We might not have visions like Nebuchadnezzar had, these weird sort of trippy visions that he had, but do we not have big questions of life and do we not look all over the place for it? <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar finally thinks, do you know what, I'm going to get Daniel. I know that he has what he calls the, the, the spirits of God, the spirit of gods in him. He sort of recognises something different and gets him to interpret uh, the vision. And essentially this vision is about Nebuchadnezzar himself. And that God was going to bring him low, essentially, and raise him up again. And then chapter 5, Belshazzar, with the writing on the wall. You know, isn't it amazing? Sometimes I, I don't realise how much of the scripture is just in our everyday language. Like, have you not heard that phrase before? Like, the writing's on the wall, isn't it? It's like, here, here it is. That's where it originated from. And... Um, <clears throat> Essentially, um, Belshazzar is Nebuchadnezzar's son, and um, so he's got the context of his dad's uh, life and knows all the things about him and the mistakes that he made, but still, here he is, essentially making a bit of a mockery of God. He's entertaining his guests and uh, thousands of sort of royals and nobles from across the kingdom and he's entertaining them and he decides that he's going to pour wine into the goblets of, that have been stolen from the house of God just to you know, entertain his guests. And there's something in that that says to me that he doesn't have a fear of God. <laughs> and uh, he has, as he's handing out the wine, essentially he starts to see that someone appears in the room and starts writing on the walls. And again, he goes to all sorts of different people to try and interpret what the message on the wall says. No one can interpret it apart from Daniel. And he interprets what's said on the wall. So that's kind of essentially um, a, a precy of those two stories. But I just want to look at three things, lessons from these two books that are going to help us to understand a little bit more what it is to be humble and how to stay that way. The reason I shared about those people at the very beginning of the service, John Newton, Wesley, um, and... Um, uh, oh, sorry, I've forgotten his name now. Anyway, um, the, the abolitionist. Wilberforce, thank you, thank you. Um, is because of their humble lives. <laughs> and the example that they um, showed us... Um, so anyway, first lesson, so there's three lessons, um, how very Anglican I am in my preaching style. Um, three uh, keys that I just picked out. There's so many more, but here's, here's just three. The first one is from the first part of, of Daniel, chapter four, and it's basically is the power of testimony. It's reminding us of God's character and who he is and who we are as a result. It keeps us on track. Here's what it says. Kim, King Nebuchadnezzar, to the nation, nations and peoples of every language who live in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. Here he's remembering this is who God is. 
He is an eternal God. He is one whose kingdom is eternal. From generation to generation, he performs miraculous signs and wonders. He is great. He is reminding himself in these first few verses that God is king, king of all kings, and that he is not. Notice that by the end of chapter four, he's gone back to this. But in the middle, he forgets. In the middle of chapter four, Nebuchadnezzar clearly forgets these truths that he's written down. Let me tell you who this God is so that we remind ourselves of the testimony of God through the scripture. He is the God of the garden. He is the God who walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. Who loved them, who dwelt with them. He is the God who turned up in the desert with a widow and orphan to Hagar, broken and desperate, and he heard her cry. He is the God who turned up in holiness in a burning bush and spoke to Moses of the rescue of his people from captivity. He is the rescuer of Israel from captivity. He's the God who split the sea in two. So powerful is he that the people of God would walk through on dry land. He is the God who guides his people through their rebellion and through their hard-heartedness even, through the wilderness, day and night. He was with them. He's the God who was with the people when they turned their backs and were in exile. He is the God who turns up in the person of Jesus. He's the God who heals and frees us. He is the God who washes feet. He's the God who went to a cross and was nailed to it for us. So much did he love us. He's the God who rose again. He is the God who dwells in his people right now, in you and me, by his spirit. And he is the God who will come again in glory and redeem all things and all people to himself. Isn't that powerful? Doesn't that remind you of who he is? And spur you on. He is the king of all kings. It's interesting that I chose, didn't I? He is the God who washes feet. The one who can get to the lowest of low positions. And choose to do that. In order to show that royalty in the kingdom of God looks like serving people. Washing Filthy, smelly, dirty feet. <laughs> you can see um, in this, I love the fact that Nebuchadnezzar does do this in the very beginning, but just a lesson for us from chapter four, like he forgets who God is and starts to think more of himself than he should. He forgets all of this stuff that he said almost in the, the first part of the chapter and gets too big for his boots. He forgets who God is. A lesson for us, friends, we need to remind ourselves of who God is, right? The world around us can poison us towards God in so many ways. Like, and we can look around at other people's lives and we can just go, hey, they've got it better than me. Like, poor old me. Comparison robs you of joy and robs you of who God is. <laughs> Makes you look at other things. Let me remind you that he came for you. He loves you that much. He loves you. Let's remember who he is, friends, this morning, that would keep our eyes fixed on him and on who he is. 
That's number one, the power of testimony, essentially remembering who God is and what he's done. Number two, pay attention to God's word. Receive correction where we need it. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says this, familiar words to some of us, I'm sure. All scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Kevin DeYoung puts it like this. Scripture is profitable for training in righteousness. No one succeeds at the highest levels in sport without working out. No one makes it in music without lots of practice. No one excels in scholarship without years of study. And no one makes it far in the school of holiness without hours and days and years in the word. You and I simply will not mature as quickly minister as effectively or live as gloriously without immersing ourselves in the scriptures. How does scripture help us to stay humble? Well, the Bible is God's uh, blueprint for living life to the full. When scripture informs us, our way of doing things is challenged. If we allow scripture to sink in, And with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we begin to change our ways, our attitudes, our understanding of the world, and come into line with the best way, and that's God's way. You see, for me, again, going back to those heroes that I said at the very beginning, they immerse themselves in the scripture. They did this day in, day out. And as we look to Jesus, he showed a life of pure humility. He lived, in, he lived the purest and holy life, lined up with scriptural living, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day. His life is an example to us of what holy living looks like. Looks like A life informed by scripture and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Receiving correction, right? from the scripture (laughs) requires our humility too, doesn't it? How do we react when someone from a a Christian friend challenges us on something? Maybe sees something that we don't see for ourselves. How do we react? Do we leap to our own defence? Like so many times in, I know that in, in arguments that we've had in the past, like Danusha and I, like she's just so brilliantly humble and I'm so not. Um, I leap to my own defence so quickly. I don't hear sometimes what she's saying. Do we do that with our Christian friends around us who might just want to challenge us on something that needs to change? Maybe we become more entrenched in our way of thinking or acting. You know, I'm right. I'm definitely right on this thing. And you're wrong. Or do we respond in humility and say, do you know what? You've got a point there. I need to grow in that area. Can you help me? The thing is, what happens here for um, Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4, particularly, is that he is given a warning The dream is a warning, and I see it as a grace thing more than anything. Like God is showing him, this is what's going to happen if things don't change. And 12 months later, it says that it came to be because Nebuchadnezzar didn't hear. He didn't listen. He didn't take on the advice or the correction, essentially, of what God was saying. So friends, let's be ones who, like Jesus, are humble, don't think of ourselves too lofty, and will allow people that we know, love, and trust to speak into our lives and maybe just say, hey, have you thought about doing it this way? You know, to challenge us and help us to grow. Scripture says iron sharpens iron, right? 
Sometimes it takes a tough knock to take off our edges, <laughs> the things that need to change in us. Okay, so that's, that's number two. Pay attention to God's word. And then number three, and finally, don't put your trust in created things. Put your trust and reliance on God. And there's obviously some overlap with some of what Johnny was preaching on last week in terms of reliance and dependence. Brilliant message. Please go back and listen to that if you haven't heard it. Um, So don't put your trust in created things. So here, Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4, he puts his trust in power, the power that he has, the influence that he has. He grew too big for his boots and essentially he became prideful. This is all about me. Look at what I have built Here's what Daniel says. He's interpreted the dream. In in chapter 4, verse uh, verse 27, he says this after his interpretation. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what's right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. You see, I think that's a grace moment right there. Like, here's your opportunity. I've given you this chance. God's really laid it out to him. And then this happens in verse uh, 28. The dream is fulfilled. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar 12 months later. As the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? You can see then why the vision was then fulfilled. He essentially went crazy. He went crackers and he was um, his all of the people around him essentially sort of rejected him and pushed him out. The vision was fulfilled. But then verse 34 at the end of this chapter, at the end of that time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven. There wasn't even like a repentance. It was literally just a recognition. (sighs) There's someone higher than me. And my sanity was restored, it says. Then I praised the Most High. I honoured and glorified him who loves forever. And it says, at the same time that my sanity was restored, my honour and splendour were returned. So God actually restored to him that which was lost. It just literally took his, his humility and his recognition that there was someone greater than him. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And all those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. Those words should carry so much weight because they were literally, it's, it's like Nebuchadnezzar writing them himself and then his very son does not take any of that on board. It's like it never happened to his dad. And he decides that he's going to just do it all his own way. He puts his trust in material gods. He praised, it says in chapter 5, the gods of silver, gold, iron, wood and stone. He didn't take on board any of this stuff that God had done, the God of heaven and earth. (laughs) He decided, actually, I'm just going to put my trust in the material things that are right in front of me. And then we see this writing on the wall as, as he's in this great banquet. And here's what it says in verse 22. But you, Belshazzar, his son, have not humbled yourself. This is Daniel speaking. Though you knew all this, He knew all of the stuff from before, from his dad. 
Instead, you've set yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You had the goblets from his temple brought to you, and you and your nobles, your wives, and your concubines drank wine from them. You praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which cannot see or hear or understand. But you did not honour the God who holds his... Hold, holds in his hands your life and all your ways. Therefore, he sent the hand that wrote the inscription. And the inscription literally says this. God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. You have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. So what's the lessons Clearly, Nebuchadnezzar did have some humility and he learned a lesson. But Belshazzar did not. Let's not put our trust in our own greatness like Belshazzar did. Let's not put our trust in our position, our power, our influence, maybe how much we have. Let's not put our trust in what the world has to offer. It leads nowhere. Just quickly, a testimony from my own life. I tried it my way. For years, I tried it my way. I was at age 20 at university, um, drinking myself silly every night. Being a student, I clearly didn't have anything else to do. So, you know, like that was what I was doing. And it was empty. My friends didn't really know who I was. I was trying to pursue something that the world was kind of throwing at me. This is fun. This is going to be great. And it was misery. It was absolute misery. And you know what? I can relate to the moment when Nebuchadnezzar literally just looks up. And I remember that night really well. I was blind drunk, but depressed. I couldn't stay out. And I just looked at the ceiling and I said, help me. Help me. And God started to intervene in my life. My life is completely different now. And it's full. And it's wonderful. <laughs> but you know, it took something in me to say, do you know what, I don't know the right way. I haven't got this all sewn up. I've tried all of this other stuff. It doesn't fulfill me. I need you. <laughs> I need the one who created me. I need the one who holds my life. I need that one. So, as I come to a close, I'm just going to ask the band to just to come up and just repeat those three um, things, those lessons in humility. The power of testimony, remind yourself of who God is and how he has worked in your life. Sometimes we can work our way through scripture to remind ourselves, like I did, that's the most helpful place to start. And then we can start to think of what he's done in our lives. Pay attention, number two, to God's word. Receive correction where we need it. Pay attention to what he's saying. And then number three, don't put your trust in created things. Put your trust in him only. And he won't let you down. It, he will not let you down.